Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That is probably the most popular song that's ever been sung at any church in the world. It was written by a man by the name of John Newton, and his story is familiar to many of you. Um, John Newton was a rebellious child and at a very young age joined the British military, but He was one of those kids that was, he had just had a bad attitude, he was morally corrupt, and he caused so much stress to the ship captain. Um, He made so much fun of the ship captain. In fact, as stories are told about John Newton, he would actually create poems that negatively portrayed the ship's captain. And finally, the ship captain had had enough, and John Newton was known as one of the most profane men on the entire ship and he had him uh, put in stockades and placed in the area where all the slaves were and after some time um, he wasn't eating he was malnourished he began to really struggle he eventually broke away and he abandoned the ship was re-arrested later on placed back in the stockades and basically lived on the ship as if he was a slave. Later on, uh, through some circumstances, John Newton was given the opportunity to captain eventually his own slave ship. And so for years, this profane man uh, would go into areas in Africa and he would capture people and he would bring them to the states, and he would sell them and trade them and barter them for things like molasses. And as the story goes, John Newton on one of these slave trading trips hit a storm that um, in most circumstances would cause everyone on the ship to lose their life. And as he is in his captain's stateroom and he is convinced this ship is going to sink. For whatever reason, he was reminded of a book that he had read years and years before on the ship. And uh, that book was titled, The Imitation of Christ. And that short book that he read years and years before had planted a seed inside of his heart. And so when this ship is about to sink, he cries out at the top of his lungs, Lord, have mercy on us. And as the story goes, the ship was saved. And later on, John Newton became 
Uh, he continued to be the captain of a slave ship, but became the Christian captain of the slave ship. And later on, he became a lay minister, and he began to preach and write many songs. And as he reflected back on who he was, and he reflected back on everything that Jesus had saved him from, he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. So when you hear those words, when it says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That is the story of John Newton. It's literally him saying, hey, if there's anyone who should have been unworthy of mercy and grace for the way they lived their life, it was me. But in my distress, much like Jonah said, I called out to the Lord and my prayer rose to him and he answered my prayer. So this morning, as we continue our series uh, called The Pursuit of Happiness and we continue to look at the Beatitudes today, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 7. Now I want to remind you of the previous Beatitudes because now we're on the fifth one. But you'll remember Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Basically, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who realize they're spiritually bankrupt. They realize that they're broken. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, it said, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Basically, Jesus was saying, blessed are those who are willing to not only realize they're spiritually broken, but they're willing to grieve and mourn over their brokenness and their failures. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, it says, blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. And that's a reminder that those who wait meekly for God and his divine timing. And then finally, last week, uh, many of you heard me share uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, which says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. That each one of us, we are created with this jesus size hole in our heart, and that we will spend all of our life trying to fill this emptiness, this longing, this hunger, this insatiable thirst that's inside of us, but ultimately it can only be filled in a relationship with Jesus because it is a Jesus-sized hole that's in our life. But then what Jesus does is he takes the next three Beatitudes to really describe righteousness. And the next three Beatitudes show us how righteousness abounds in the heart of someone who is genuinely hungry and genuinely thirsty. And uh, it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. And this beatitude, I think, sums up amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I bet later on in John Newton's life, he probably reflected on this particular beatitude. And he's like, hey, if there's anybody that relates to that, it's me. When Jesus simply said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Every single week, I've not only been uh, reading it in the NIV, but I've been reading it in the message translation, which is the translation of the Bible that I'm reading through this year. And here's what the message says. The message says, you're blessed when you care. Because at the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. So today we're going to talk about, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. I want to ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone say, dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. What is mercy? Now seriously, what does mercy look like? Um, how are we people that live uh, a merciful life? Mercy is defined as 
showing kindness or forgiving treatment to someone who otherwise could be treated harshly. Mercy is kindness or help given to people who are in a very bad or desperate situation. Um, As I was researching mercy this week, and I googled incredible acts of mercy. And you know, you'll get pages after pages of people that showed great mercy. Um, But many of you will remember, especially if you grew up around Washington, that for years and years, we heard about the Green River Killer. This guy that um, no one knew who he was, but he was brutally murdering woman after woman. And um, I remember growing up in the 80s, we'd hear about this person all the time. And there'd be moments, uh, I'd leave the house and, you know, your mom would warn you to be careful because that guy is still at large. Well, years later, um, it was found out who did it. and He was arrested and he eventually pled guilty. And when uh, he is being sentenced, the judge allowed all of the family members of the 60 victims to come and share something with the Green River Killer. And Every single one. I mean, they said just the types of things that you'd expect. I mean, they were brutal. I mean, they condemned him to hell. They mocked him for spending life in prison. I mean, they hoped that terrible things would happen to him in prison. Except for a guy whose last name was Rule. His daughter had been terribly murdered by the Green River Killer. And he got up and he made this statement. He said, he said, a lot of these people hate you. And the way they feel about you, most people wouldn't blame them for the way that they feel. He said, but I'm standing here not feeling hatred for you. And he actually made a statement that I thought was really profound because it was so real. He said, it's really difficult for me to say what I'm about to say, but I know that it's what I should do. It's what I'm supposed to do. And it's what my faith compels me to do. And he looks at this person that had brutally murdered his daughter. And he said, none of them may do this. But I want you to know that I forgive you. And the entire trial, the entire sentencing, the Green River killer hadn't shown any remorse, no emotion until that moment. And when this father expressed forgiveness to him, he broke down and he wept. Church, that is mercy. It's where you show love and kindness and forgiveness to someone who you otherwise wouldn't. Someone that people wouldn't even blame you if you treated them harshly. You know, where does mercy come from? I mean, it's not human nature to to respond the way that that man did at that trial. It's not human nature. So where does mercy come from? It comes from understanding who you are. It comes from understanding. When John Newton writes Amazing Grace, he understands who he is. When he says, you saved a wretch like me. It comes from understanding that you are poor in spirit. That you have been shown mercy and grace even though you were spiritually bankrupt. It comes from being someone who mourns. The blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. It comes from someone that realizes I am spiritually bankrupt, and I have grieved my sin. And then they very meekly wait upon Jesus to come and forgive them and give them a sense of freedom and a sense of release. And it's in that moment you understand mercy. So how are you and I able to be merciful? How are we able to show mercy? Um, It comes from understanding how much mercy you've been shown. It comes from understanding how much grace you've been shown. Um, A verse that we talk about fairly often at Canyon Creek is Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. And it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. 
A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from their flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please their spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. You see, when it comes to mercy, it really becomes an issue of reaping and sowing. Because if you're someone who sows mercy, if you're someone who shows grace, if you're someone who shows forgiveness, sows forgiveness, when the time comes and you need mercy and you need grace and you need forgiveness, you will reap what you've sown. And it's one of the challenges that we have in church because oftentimes we can, as I've talked about for several weeks, we can find ourselves, the farther we are from our conversion experience, from that moment where the ship is going down and we cry out, Lord, have mercy on us, the farther we get from that moment, the more pious and self-righteous and borderline judgmental we can become with other people. But you need to remember, blessed are the merciful. They'll be shown mercy. That you will reap what you sow. And you and I should constantly live in this state of grace, in this state of mercy, in this state of understanding and compassion for other people because we realize that we are only here because of amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I mean, that's how we stay in this position where we're constantly able to show mercy and compassion and grace to other people. But church, I'm going to tell you, if you are ungracious, if you are unhelpful, if you are unmerciful, I mean, Paul warned us in Galatians that you will reap what you show, what you sow. And you and I, we were shown so much mercy from God that it should be natural for us to show mercy to other people. Uh, Jesus went on to share a parable where he literally illustrated mercy. And he was having a conversation with a man who said, um, how should a person act if they want to be someone who receives mercy on judgment day? And then Jesus responded in Luke chapter 10. He said, well, uh, if you want to be someone who receives mercy on judgment day, then you need to obey the commands. You need to live right. He said, you need to love God with all your heart and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, what Jesus was saying was, Blessed are those who show mercy to their neighbor, for they shall receive mercy of eternal life in the future. And so the man follows up, and what does he say? He says, well, I'm confused. Then who qualifies as my neighbor? And Jesus shares one of the most famous parables. We read it in Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 30. And the parable goes like this. It says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to an inn to take care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus shares uh, this very famous parable, parable of the Good Samaritan, to illustrate grace. And John Piper once taught on this parable, and he said it really shows us the four dimensions of mercy. And he describes what those four dimensions of mercy that Jesus illustrates in this parable are. And if the answer is, blessed are those who 
are merciful, for they'll be shown mercy, then these are elements that you guys, that you and I, we should desire to have in our life. So uh, the first one he says is mercy always sees distress. So verse 33, what happened? This Samaritan saw this man who'd been beaten and bruised and you know, left for dead while the priest walked on one side and the Levite walked on the other side. The Samaritan saw it. Mercy sees. When you walk through the city or you're driving around and you see people that are struggling, you see people that are hurting, do you actually really notice? Because mercy sees distress. When you are walking through the lobby on Sunday morning and you interact with people, are you able to see people that are hurting? Are you able to see people that the whole reason that they even showed up to church this weekend is because they realize, man, there is a hole in my heart. There is something missing in my life. I need something. Are you able to see that distress? Um, I think it's probably one of the most convicting things in the world to pause and realize that I can be oblivious to everything that's going on around me. I may hear about uh, what's happening with ISIS and I have to pause and I have to actually ask people to explain it to me. Is that you? And you're just kind of unaware to the fact that you have neighbors that are hurting and people that you go to school with that are deeply struggling that everyone we interact with Every single day, whether it's getting coffee at a Starbucks or buying our, our groceries at Central Market, wherever it is, that we are surrounded by people that are in distress. Do you notice? Well, mercy, mercy notices distress. Mercy sees hurt, sees pain second dimension of mercy that John Piper refers to is he says mercy responds initially internally with a heart of compassion meaning that when you walk through the grocery store and you see someone that's hurting you respond internally first that you are moved with compassion what does the Bible say in this parable it says the Samaritan As he traveled, he came upon the man and he saw him. And it says, at first, he took pity on him. Other translations say he had compassion for the man. Compassion is, goes beyond feeling bad for someone. Compassion says, I hurt for that person. You go beyond empathy. Empathy means you sort of feel bad for what that person's going through. You you feel for them. Compassion takes empathy a step forward where compassion says, man, I can't sit still. I mean, these people that are hurting, we have to do something about it. Uh, One of the organizations in the Everett community that our church helps is the Cocoon House. Excuse me, the Cocoon House. And they help runaway teenagers. And um, I I think as I was reading the article, they estimate that there's something like 2,500 homeless teenagers in this community, and the Cocoon House helps them. And the Cocoon House lost all of their funding, and so they're going to have to shut down unless a miracle happens with that. Well, our church has been involved with the Cocoon House. When I was a youth pastor in North Everett, I had students that were a part of the Cocoon House. And so uh, mercy would see the situation. Mercy would lead us to be moved to compassion, to want to do something about this incredibly beneficial ministry that if other organizations don't step up and help is going to shut down. Mercy responds internally with a heart of compassion. Evaluate yourself, seriously. When those rare moments come and you actually notice someone that's hurting, what goes on inside? Is it a gut response that says, I'm so glad that's not me? Or do you think, I can't sit still. I have to do something about this. 
Well, blessed are those who are merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. A man reaps what he sows. If you are someone who sows mercy, sows grace, sows forgiveness, when the time comes and you need it, you will reap mercy and grace and forgiveness. The third dimension of mercy is that not only does mercy see distress, not only does mercy respond internally with a heart of compassion, but mercy responds externally with a practical effort to help. Like mercy says, man, I can't sit still. I have to do something about this. So what happens next? Uh, He came upon the man. He saw him. He took pity on him. And verse 34, he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to the inn to take care of him. And mercy says, I have to do something about this. Uh, When we hear about the cocoon house, what is your first gut response? Is your gut response, well, that's a pity. Someone should step up and help. Or is your first gut response, what can we do as a church to do something about this? Um, Where do I give? Where do I sign up? How do I help? You see, someone who's merciful sees distress, is moved internally by what they see, and then they have to do something about it. It's why you find yourself in those moments seeing someone that's hurting and you just spontaneously hug them. You just had to do something. It's why when you see someone hurting, your first inclination is to grab your wallet and say, is there a way that I can help? When you see someone hurting or you hear a story, you're thinking, "Uh, honey, we have an open room in our house. Let's let them move in and live with us. That's mercy. Mercy says, I see hurt and I can't just stand by and watch but I have to do something about it. And remember, it comes from this deep understanding that amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It comes from this realization that I have been shown unbelievable mercy. I was morally bankrupt. I was on a highway to hell. And for whatever reason, Jesus loved me, reached out to me, showed me grace and showed me mercy. So the natural outflow from me should be to do likewise. Blessed are the merciful for they'll be shown mercy. Finally, John Piper said the fourth dimension of mercy that we see here is that mercy will act even when it's to an enemy. And I don't think there's a greater example of that than the situation with the Green River Killer and the Luke family. I mean, showing forgiveness to someone who has deeply wronged and hurt and taken the life of someone in your family um, That's like forgiveness at a level that I can't comprehend. Because I don't think anyone, even probably all the Christians in the room, would have blamed that father for saying, I will never forgive you. I'm never going to let this go. But mercy says, I was dead. I was dead to my sins. I was deserving all of the consequences for my actions. But Jesus saved me. He showed me grace. He forgave me when I didn't deserve it. I received grace immeasurable. So how can I not show the same to other people? Mercy acts even when it's an enemy. Here's what's fascinating about the story of the Good Samaritan. It's one of the illustrations that Jesus was trying to make to his audience 
was he emphasized that a Samaritan saw the man, that the man was a Jewish man, that Jewish people looked down on Samaritans. Like a Samaritan was known as someone who is a half-breed. They're half-Jewish, half-Gentile. Uh, they're hated by Jewish people. So a Samaritan comes upon a Jewish man who likely hates him in distress and shows mercy and compassion to someone who in all likelihood, had the roles been reversed, wouldn't have shown him grace and mercy. Mercy is willing to act even when it's an enemy. It's the most amazing thing about that parable. You know, it, refers, it reminds me of everything we talked about last week where I challenged you with, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they'll be filled. And a couple of the um, things that I reminded you last week as I was describing righteousness, I, I talked about uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, which says, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. So what you have a great illustration in the parable of the Good Samaritan is where this person probably in other situations would have wronged the Samaritan. The Samaritan turned the other cheek. Matthew chapter 5 verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So the Samaritan gets an opportunity to live out the Sermon on the Mount comes upon this Jewish man who's beaten, left for dead in distress when it would be normal to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It would been normal for him to hate him. Instead, he loved his enemy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. So at the end of Luke chapter 10, the parable Jesus shares the moral of the story, and he, he does this really well whenever he teaches in parables. He said, which of these three men, between the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? So the man obviously responds, uh, the one who had mercy on him. Then Jesus looks at him and he says, absolutely right. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Now, go and do likewise. Church, blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. You want to live a rich, full, meaningful life. You want to have a happy life. You want to discover satisfaction. Be merciful. Because when the time comes and you need mercy, and mark my words, it'll come. You will be shown mercy. Whoever has been shown much mercy should be willing to give much mercy. And I don't know about you, but when I look at my spiritual journey and I look at all the times Jesus has shown me grace and he's extended forgiveness and he's shown me mercy, um, I relate to amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So today my prayer is that all week long this beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they, they shall be sown mercy is running through your head over and over and over again as you interact with people, maybe people that even rub you wrong. I want to ask everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes.